Jeremy, I enjoyed our first conversation around the fact that industrial transformation is very real. And what I'd like to do in this conversation is really talk about the pace at which that's moving and how people are adapting to that. So what's your sense of kind of where we're at in that journey and how things are moving currently and how organizations are adapting to that transformation? Well, I would say my honest assessment is that most organizations are not going quickly enough mm -hmm. at their own peril. I think organizations are going too slow. Okay. And I, I'm really, that, that's a good conversation for us to sit down and chew on. Yeah. It, I actually, it, just to kick it off, the, there was a, a trip. Gary Koopman is the K of KCF. Okay. And we were together in Finland. Actually, it, the main work was in a, a town north of Finland called Tempera. Okay. Tempera, Finland, which is actually near where Nokia is from. Oh, yeah. This was in the mid-2000s, the early days of KCF. And we were doing some specialty consulting and training with other experts like us, more narrowly focused in just our field of expertise, vibration and machines and acoustics. And we, after we finished our engagement, we actually got invited to go tour the Nokia facilities oh, nice. up there and saw the, just these some best, just world-class acoustics facilities. Yeah. And people that are younger may not realize that, you know, in the mid 2000s, you, right now, everybody maybe has an iPhone or a right. Samsung right. phone. Back then, everybody had a Nokia yeah. phone. <laughs> and it was this small, I mean, literally came from this small town north of Helsinki wow. in Finland. It's, ama it's an amazing story. And yet, what happened, we were there, we saw all this best, best in class facilities. We didn't come anywhere close to meeting the CEO. We, were, <laughs> we didn't have that type of uh, exposure at that time. But, but what happened was, you know, just a few years after that, Apple released the iPhone. And it started to transform the, the telecommunications and smartphone industry. And, and within five years of that date, I mean, basically, once the iPhone came out, the, you know, kind of the future was maybe set. But... Within five years, the, the, the business transformation just completely disarmed Nokia to the tune. They had, they had, had more than 50% market share globally of smartphones. And it dwindled so much that there's a very, a very notable video that probably many have seen where the CEO, they, they later got acquired, absorbed into Microsoft. And the CEO of, Microsoft, uh, of Nokia was very tearful and, and his whole team was, was tearful and just acknowledging that, that their business had just completely failed and just crumbled beneath their feet. And one of the things he said was that we never, we didn't do anything wrong. We, yeah. but somehow we failed was, was I believe his quote. And you know, that's, it's, it's, it's sort of tragic to go back and look at how that story ended. And the, the word of caution, I would say, well, first of all, I would say that they did do something wrong. And I, you know, that's not a judgment because obviously, the, you know, the business world is competitive. And in order for, for Apple and, and Steve Jobs, you know, to become this renaissance of, of smartphone technology, someone had to fail. So right. it may have been inevitable. But when you have the benefit of hindsight, what, what they failed to do was stay on the cutting edge of technology and learn and adapt. And that's what happens in nature. That's what happens in business. It doesn't always happen, but when there is a large transformational um, shift, those who fail to follow that shift fail catastrophically and quickly. And that, that's, that's what I, I see. You know, I think that that is very much what, what's in play already and going to be in play during the next three to five years. And it, the really fascinating thing is you, know, you look at Nokia and Apple and that was their product. You know, that was innovation related to their product. What's fascinating about industry 4.0 in the industrial internet of things is it's an outside technology that, that's basically affecting everyone's ability to, to do whatever that they do. Whether, whether you're making electricity, making cars, making chemicals, uh, whatever you're making, this transformation is sort of hitting you from the back. Right. And so it's that much more difficult to, to be ready for it and to move quickly. And that's the situation that I see playing out. Uh, it's a very stark example. And I appreciate you telling that story because I remember Nokia phones. I remember that process of what they went through. And only looking internally, you're right. They didn't see the challenge of what they missed. And I like what you just said there at the end, we need to look at the outside impact of this. 
And so if I'm an operational leader within my organization, uh, how do I begin to keep up with this pace of change? And how do I begin to help move our organization to speed it needs to be moving to, uh, to deal with this transformation that we face? So I think the first step is to, is to recognize not only that you need a plan. Again, we, we yeah. talked about the 60% right. and more of, of the companies recognize that they have to do something. Right. But just because you're doing something doesn't mean, number one, that you're doing it thoroughly enough, fast enough. Right. And number two, it doesn't assume that you're doing it well. Yeah. And you have to do it both fast and well in order to avoid this, this extinction event that, that, that's ahead of us. I, I would start by just, you know, we have personal history. We went too slow also okay. during our first years of getting this. So we, we started selling this technology that we now have. We had been working on technology uh, for the government, especially the, the U.S. Department of Defense, mm -hmm. Army, submarines, helicopter, mm -hmm. uh, shipboard technology, even prosthetic limbs technology wow. for the Army, starting to deploy smart technology, wireless devices, things that are, that are now associated with the industrial internet of things. And we started to sell industrially, commercially around 2011 into 12. But the interesting thing is that we were, we were sort of distracted. What caused us to go slow is we were doing work for, for the government. We also had some big partnerships that we thought were going to be the right path. And what we should have been doing was just what we're doing now, which is rolling up our sleeves, getting into the factories and solving problems with the technology which allowed us to go fast, but instead we were going slow. And in 2014, we hit a very low point in our company's trajectory and history. And um, th it was the same reason. So yeah. what, what I would say to anyone who's operating in this current environment, and you know, this COVID crisis has been quite striking in laying bare a lot of the vulnerabilities that every company has. And the first thing is just to, to recognize that a great leap forward is possible. Not a small improvement, but a great leap forward is possible and, and, and truly commit to that possibility. And then set your action plan appropriately, which yeah. is going to mean faster. Yeah. It's, I, I always like to say the fast are going to eat the slow. The, the big eating the small is a thing of the past. <laughs> the fast eat the slow. And what it, once you believe that it's possible, you need to set an aggressive action plan and that's very much out of step with the way most of these big companies are used to behaving. And there's reasons behind that. Yeah. Just as you were explaining that, Jeremy, as I was reflecting on what you were saying, it's shifted my thinking about this planning versus action element. Mm. I think sometimes I, I think yeah. organizations try to plan big and that takes a long time and they're acting small because they want to see incremental changes. What you're suggesting is turn that around. Mm. Plan more accurately and move faster and take bigger chances to really move where you need to go now. And so that's kind of a mind shift for organizations and for leaders and organizations. Uh, what are some ways that KCF can really partner with organizations like ours to accomplish that and to help us make that shift and then we can take the right actions to move at the right speed? Sure, I think, yeah, having that mind shift to take, to take bigger, more aggressive steps is right, but it also doesn't have to be all at once. Yeah. I think just to, to, to dive into a reason, you know, there are reasons, of course, why all these things are the way that they are. The intention to do the best is typically there. That, that's right. That's in the, you know. There's a strong sense of momentum in most industries. And they, they do tend to do more planning and incremental improvements. And it's because they have been in a, in a relatively competitive environment without a whole lot of disruptive change for a long time. Okay. You know, if anything, the big disruptive change that's played out over the last decades has been global competition. Right. But that's been more of a, a slow starvation type of challenge. Right. You have to get a little bit leaner every year and a little right. bit leaner. But those are gradual improvements that can be planned. Yeah. This is different than that. This is a tsunami wave that's going to catch you blindsided if you're not ready for it. So that's the first thing is just to, to recognize basically that um, that there's a, a difference in behavior that's appropriate to, to those two situations. Um, the second thing is that, that we see that there's, when companies are planning and when they're assessing, even just trying to assess the effectiveness of, of their big bites, you know, biting out the, right. these problems, companies tend to be very conservative. Okay. And 
again, I think that that historically serves you well when you're in a, a typical industrial corporation. We hear customers say things like, you know, well, well, the we have this equipment, fans or pumps, and we've started using the technology often at a very small scale. And we say, well, what was the impact? And they and they say, well, even if you just count the the cost of the motor itself, the motor would have fried and been you know right. catastrophically right. damaged. Yeah. Even if you just count the value of that motor, the technology pays for itself. And to that, I say that that's conservative. And it's a good way to not get in trouble with your boss. You but in this world, if you never get in trouble with your boss, you're never going to make an aggressive enough plan to keep up with the best in class. What I encourage is to not be conservative and careful in your assessments, but rather just seek to be accurate. I'm not saying to be aggressive, you know, just right. wantonly aggressive. I'm saying do your best to, to truly discern the economic impact of this transformative change. Okay. And that, that is, is the action from a leadership standpoint that will cause you to set the right plan. And, and just holistically, the dominant pattern is that most companies are not doing that. Yeah. Most companies are conservative and most companies are um, just used to a, a status quo where planning and incremental change has, has caused them to survive. There's a, there's a third factor which I'm aware of, and I, I think it's just that um, it's not so much that, well, those two factors are there, the conservatism and the, just the, the status quo. But the third one is, is just the transformation itself. The way I would phrase it is that the industrial internet of things or industry 4.0 is going too fast. Okay. And one, one way I have started to think about that is if you look at our company, you look at our company five years ago, as I was describing, we were, we were only 22 people, you know, and we didn't have so many of the capabilities that are now becoming common, at least within our customer base, cloud connectivity, software, you know, yeah. some of the things we'll talk about in the next session about how to actually get this done enterprise software, uh, data integrations. None of those things existed five years ago. And you look at the change we've experienced from then till now, 10x growth in, in all this functional capability. I think when, when you are an industrial manufacturer, it's hard to notice and perceive that rate of change. Mm -hmm. And that causes companies to maybe, you had mentioned partnerships, it causes companies to try to do things more internally right. because again, right. that's been the, the historical behavior. Instead, what we see works better is when companies recognize that there's something happening that's on a very fast track and then put together the ecosystem of, of, of partners who are thriving exclusively right. within those, those lanes. Companies like us and other companies in different lanes, when you get them to work together in concert, you can go a lot faster, but it's hard to notice when you're living in the world uh, of an industrial manufacturing landscape. Yeah. So it sounds to me that raising that awareness, thinking about that planning differently, and thinking about the speed at which we adapt to things is really critical for us to be thinking about internally and not just relying on this is the way we've done it here and I have to kind of maintain those current structures and systems. So very helpful in that. Excellent. Yes. Well, that really paints a nice picture of kind of um, how we can, how we need to think about this differently, go a little bit faster in this direction and move there. Uh, and really helpful to kind of link that to what we talked about in our first session about why we do it now. And so I think what we want to kind of do is set ourselves up now for a follow up on this that is, what is that path? And what are some, some of those key things you've learned that really help us to, to get there? And so uh, any, any last thoughts around this issue of speed as we begin to transition our thinking to the idea of the path forward? Sure. And actually, yeah, I will just to, to cue that up because that's really in the how to. Yeah. But a couple of things that frame it. You know, when, when you asked about how, what steps can you actually take? There are some patterns we've noticed and some, some benchmarks that, that we've quantified. First on the, on the patterns, there's kind of these three convergent circles. If you, if you look at how to, how to go fast, how to take a big chunk out of a big problem that you yeah. maybe didn't know was there. The first one is you have to, you have to execute. You have to deploy technology okay. and problem solving people, whether they're yours or ours or some other partners, you have to attack the problem aggressively and execute against it. Okay. That's the first circle. The second one is you have to prove that it actually had an impact. Okay. 
or or honestly if it didn't have an impact right and when you get that it, it's typically economic proof but it, it can be documented uh, documenting reduced safety incidents right. it can be documenting oee improvements it can be there's, there's a lot of different measures it's whatever makes sense to your business but the proof is the key gotcha. and then the third one the third circle is to evangelize okay you know typically most of these industrial manufacturing companies are so large that the decision making process is highly uh, complex and involves many people and they transform one at a time you know it's not like everybody suddenly agrees on this <laughs> new future one person agrees on the new future yeah. but there's an there's an evangelical aspect to it that happens internally within each company so just recognizing that those three circles are necessary before you can really go and then what i would say from a benchmarking standpoint in in terms of going too slow there's two ways to quantify it you know there there's just the deployment of technology most companies today at least in their balance of plant machinery the the non absolutely critical assets they're they're mostly just blind there is no real-time machine health data flow flowing from them and that's a, the first part of what's enabled uh by industry 4.0 industrial internet of things just what we do is you get the data flowing you get you get sensors you get coverage on those assets and that's a matter of going wide okay. uh, the way i can quantify that is it, it turns out when you do the math we looked at a lot of our best in class customers you end up with approximately the same number of of real-time connected sensors if, as you have employees not employees in the factory but employees in the whole enterprise and there are reasons, you know, it's kind of the relationship of, of capital intensity, how much machinery there is in a factory to, related to the total headcount. In fact, one of the things we've studied during this crisis is that the largest headcount in most industrial operations are those who are performing maintenance on the equipment. And that's part of why those two numbers are related. But you can quantify it that way. If you have the same number of sensors as employees that are connected in real time, that's a pretty good benchmark. And the second one is just value creation. You know, you could do it by dollar. Like we, our, our thriving customers are typically generating about $10,000 of value per year per sensor. Wow. And you can look at it that way or by ROI, you know, a typical, a typical customer that's doing it well is generating about a 10 times ROI every year wow. on the technology ten investments. Times. And ten, it is, it's that's real. And it, you know, you can just imagine if if you're doing that and your competitor isn't, yeah. that that is how the extinction begins. Yeah. Or the flip of it is if your competitor is doing it and you're not, yeah. then you're That's vulnerable right. to extinction. <laughs> and it is going to be one or the other in most industry sectors. And that's that's the consequence of going too slow. Yeah. Okay. And that really, yeah, I like those benchmarks you put in there because that helps me begin to think about it from a, a organization standpoint understand where I may need to go in the plan and how I'm going to begin to measure that success. And I can begin to do some basic math around that and say, here's what the investment looks like and here's what the outcome can be. So that really kind of sets that tone for how we can adapt more quickly in that. So Yeah, I asked the question, you know, just for any for any company listening, just just to ask yourself, you, you might think we could get to this great outcome by 2025 or 2030. But what, you know, just to, to express that, what if we got there by 2022? Yeah. Wow. What if we got there by 2021? That's the exciting thing to think about. You know, it, it's 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 the right way to look at it, in my yeah. opinion. Now you're getting ready to go at a fast pace. 2021, 2022. That's that's right around the corner. It has some real implications. <laughs> yeah, certainly. That, 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 definitely. Excellent. Well, good. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Really good insight around again, uh, kind of how we while we're going too slow, how we can pick up that pace. Looking forward to our follow up conversation. Is how do we build that path? And how do we really get everyone aligned around that? so we can achieve those great results. So, Fantastic. Thank yeah, thanks, Kevin. Excellent.